so much for joining us tonight and welcome to another Silent Journal Club. Welcome to those of you who were here with us in October. And thank you, a special thank you for those of us who are joining us for the first time. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kimmy and I am the chair of the Scientific Literacy Committee at TLC. I live in Boston, Massachusetts, and I am getting my master's in psychology, and I also work at a small oncology biotech managing their clinical trials. So I live and breathe research all day, every day. Um, and as far as our little group, our mission is to make the science about BFRBs accessible and understandable to the general public. So we believe that now is an extremely exciting time to be in the BFRB community and to be tuned into BFRB research. And given the unique nature of BFRBs, so many people have them and yet they're still so under-researched and under-discussed, we want to break down the exciting research that is coming out in such a way that you guys can feel empowered to directly apply it to your own lives, whether you're educating a provider or helping um, your loved ones or even just advocating for yourself. So the three of us have varying degrees of scientific background, but something that we all have in common and what I guess we have in common with all of you on the line is a common passion for BFRB science. So for those of you who don't know what a journal club is, it is a informal type of scientific discussion um, where each of us has selected a paper to um, briefly discuss and place in a broader context. And our hope in doing this is that by taking these important and seemingly in intimidating, not gonna lie, um, studies and breaking them down in a more casual setting. Our hope is that that they don't seem so scary anymore and that you can retain the information a little bit easier and refer back to it in the future. Um, so for those of us, for those of you who were with us in October, we did kind of a like all time favorite papers then, but this time we're doing something a little bit different and we're, we've chosen some of the latest and greatest. So all of the papers that we're going to be talking about um, haven't been, uh, were published no more than a few months ago. And you will also see them summarized in the 2021 um, zine that will be coming out at the time of the conference. That is very much in the works. Um, so we're really excited about these papers. You should have gotten links to them when you registered. And I hope you did take some time prior to tonight to just skim them over. It is easier to follow along if you did read them, but don't worry if you didn't, we're gonna break everything down for you. Um, one little caveat, none of the three of us are doctors and these are not our papers. So we are hope we have the luxury of being objective <laughs> more than if any of the authors were on the line talking about their own work. Um, but we can only speak to what we know. And we, I recognize some very educated people on the line that I'm hoping will share their own perspectives and, and fill in so that we can arrive at something that is um, well understood. Moving just super briefly into some house rules, um, Kathleen mentioned a lot of these already. We're dedicating about 20, 25 minutes to each paper. Um, we have time at the end to swing back to anything that we missed. Um, each section is going to consist of a brief rundown from one of us, uh, about 10 minutes, and then we have most of the time for a discussion and Q&A. We do ask that you stay muted while um, we're doing the rundown portion, but if you think of something while one of us is talking, please feel free to drop it in the chat. We uh, will be referring to your questions and comments in the chat as we go along. And um, when it is time for discussion, you can continue to use the chat. Like Kathleen said, you can use the raise hand feature or you can just unmute yourself and talk. I know there are kind of a lot of us on the line right now, but these types of discussions always work best when people are willing to be engaged. So please don't be shy. We're so excited to hear from all of you. Um, so please speak up. And so that said, I will turn it over to the Hannahs to introduce themselves and we'll get started. 
So we'll start with Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah Doyle. <laughs> I'm 24 and I'm a PhD student in neuroscience at Brown University. And I'm interested in studying um, the neural mechanisms underlying OCD and BFRBs. Thank you. And Hannah Ann. And I'm Hannah Ann. Um, I'm 21 and I live in New Jersey and Maryland. Um, and I'm a senior biology and psychology double major at McDaniel College. Awesome. Thank you both. And Hannah Ann is actually going to start us off with the first paper of the night. So this paper is the Klosowska paper um, on cognitive reappraisal and types of skin picking, a longitudinal study with pre-pandemic and COVID-19 pandemic data. Um, and so just brief synopsis of it, the aims were to um, look at data from the pandemic. A study started pre-pandemic and then after that continued through the pandemic um, because the pandemic brought a lot of changes with, into daily life with sudden lockdowns um, and social distancing, mask wearing, and just a lot of loss of contact, which the authors hypothesized had the potential to significantly increase anxiety and worry, which both have been correlated with skin picking in previous studies. Um, and cognitive reappraisal was looked at because it's a technique um, of reevaluating negative emotional stimuli um, and it reevaluating them to change the meaning and emotional valence or emotional impact, which has also been used in um, previous studies in lots of different um, psychology papers on mental illnesses and treatment, where it's been successful and people with cognitive reappraisal, really strong cognitive reappraisal skills tend to do better with negative events. The authors for this study hypothesized that both people with focused and automatic skin picking, two of the common subtypes discussed, would um, have an increase in picking during the pandemic, um, but that those who have a tendency to use cognitive reappraisal would have um, less skin picking than those that do not have that, um, or not as strong in that technique. So the methods in this study were um, participants recruited via the internet, um, they had three stages in the study. So the first one occurred before the pandemic started um, and they had 190 different participants. Uh, in the second stage, which was during the strictest lockdowns and the study was done in Poland. So that was, I think in end of March-ish. Um, and they had 49 of those 100, original 190 answer the second set of surveys and questions and then the third time period was during later lockdowns and they had 32 um, of the 49 who were of the 190 uh, who answered the third set. So there were 32 overall who were able to answer every single stage of the study. And the participants um, took several different psychological measurements looking at skin picking, emotional regulation, loneliness, stress, and other demographic and environmental factors, like who they live with, um, what their relationship is to other people in their household. And so results from the study showed that the main effect, so looking specifically at cognitive reappraisal or time, didn't have any impact on automatic skin picking. And time also didn't have an effect on focus skin picking, but cognitive reappraisal decreased the amount of focused skin picking. And then they looked also at interaction effects. So the effect of um, time and cognitive reappraisal on either automatic or focused. So the, the combined effect, and it was significant or uh, had an impact in the cases of automatic skin picking where it decreased the amount of picking um, and when they looked even closer at that interaction, they found it actually only occurred before the pandemic. And then um, in focused picking, the interaction effect between time and um, cognitive reappraisal wasn't um, significant at either point of time. And then, so just sort of a general bit on that, um, the data collected in the study didn't actually confirm the researcher's hypothesis because it showed that the skin picking didn't increase overall during the pandemic and that there wasn't much of a difference between automatic and focused pickers during the full lockdown and the lightened lockdown time periods. Um, and these lack of changes happened to match with the um, 
loneliness and perceived stress measurements the researchers took because those also didn't change between the um, full lockdown and lightened lockdown times. And those are two, um, two measurements that have previously been shown to uh, have changes in the amount of skin picking. So some caveats in this study was it was all self-report based. So there, it's a bit um, more subjective, which isn't the best, but it's hard to get really objective in-person data during a pandemic. Um, and the participant number also dropped significantly from the start. Um, but part of that was because the first set of people were recruited over eight months, which does leave a lot of time and make things more difficult for getting back to people. And they also didn't measure stress and loneliness at the first time point. They only measured it during lockdown and lightened lockdown, which means that while the stress and loneliness didn't change during the two lockdown periods, it could have changed from the baseline point to the lockdowns, but we don't know. And that maybe would have had some significant effect on another part of the study, but that won't be able to be figured out. But implications from the study, um, the results did confirm that cognitive reappraisal is correlated with decreased skin picking like previous studies have shown, which is uh, another really strong aspect to add into more research and lead into more research on figuring out how it best works with different subtypes. If there are ways we can get it to work with say automatic picking since it wasn't as effective there um, and how to lead into even more research on how to teach and use cognitive reappraisal in all BFRBs and even more specifically in skin picking. I have a question for you, Hannah. Yes. Do you believe the results as presented or do you think that there was perhaps, uh, that they perhaps got these results because of the methods they used? Because I, for one, don't believe that skin picking decreased over the course of the pandemic. I actually have one other point in that um, they didn't, the, a lot of the, pretty much everyone in that went through the full study, when they were locked down, they were locked down with family or other people that they lived with. So no one was completely alone, which also could have affected it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it was interesting to say the least on that results, but I think, I mean, I think the fact that it didn't technically, it didn't decrease necessarily because the time part didn't affect the decrease. It was only the cognitive reappraisal abilities. Um, so they had less picking than the people who didn't have the cognitive reappraisal techniques. Um, they didn't necessarily say it like decreased um, like over the course of the time, it was compared to the people who didn't have the stronger cognitive reappraisal techniques. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So you that, think that they're legitimate, okay. I do, I don't think, I, I think I made it sound weird that it was like skin picking decreased during a global pandemic. Yeah, so that's not that's not what they came to the conclusion on. We okay, thank you for clarifying. In the chat, uh, if we could e explain a little bit more about what cognitive reappraisal is and how do they measure it? Yes, I'm gonna pull up my copy of the article to see exactly what they use to measure it. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a known psychological scale. Uh, let me see. I believe they used da, 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 the emotion regulation questionnaire uh, translated into Polish. Um, it's a self-report questionnaire with 10 items, different subscales for measuring different emotion regulation strategies. Um, one of them being expressive suppression and the other one being cognitive reappraisal. And then more on cognitive reappraisal. Um, yeah, I, is this like a, people who have the tendency to, to use cognitive reappraisal or is it like people who have gone to therapy and been taught cognitive reappraisal? Like that's a very different thing in my mind. Well, it can be taught and some people just do it in general. Um, it's sort of, it's a flexible, a flexibility strategy. Um, and I think it, it 
sort of depends on a lot of factors. It's something that is definitely taught in a lot of therapy. Um, but there are people just out in the world who have never um, been to therapy who are more likely to have these strategies from yeah. whether it's so from, like their personalities. Yeah. Are different essentially. Okay. <laughs> it's essentially I, reframing stimuli yeah, or situations. A couple, a couple of people are asking them. about reframing, if you can address that. Yeah. So reframing in that it's, it's not reframing, like, let's just not think about it and pretend it's not there, but it's like this thing sort of happened and that's that. And how can I look at it in a way that makes it less negative? Um, I think that's like the easiest description. What's a good example specific to hair pulling or skin picking that you can um, think of? Oh gosh. Um, I guess. Um, like, do you think maybe people who are like, oh, my BFRB serves a function for me. So it's not like this horrible monstrous thing. It's trying to tell me something and yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what it is. And so I can take care of myself. Yeah, I think that's a good example. And it's also, I've noticed in what I've looked at it, similar to a lot of the um, acceptance and commitment therapy ideas of accepting the event and the emotion and revaluing it and saying here's what's negative about it but we can look at this part as well and so accepting that it wasn't great but seeing what you can do to either change things in the future or change the moment that you're in okay eric has a question here he's had his hand patiently raised for okay yeah, thank you for your patience, Eric. Oh, you, I, okay. I didn't know if I was told to put it in the chat, but I'll just say it. So, so they, um, unless I missed it, they, they didn't actually really report the difference in cognitive appraisal pre and post pandemic. But what they did was they showed you that, okay, pre pandemic cognitive appraisal has this negative relationship with skin picking, which, which is great. Um, but then post pandemic, it's not significant. But then again, if you look at the plot, it's actually a flipped relationship. So even though it's not significant, there's some kind of weird thing going on there. What they didn't show you though, is whether or not the actual cognitive pre-appraisal, and it's just a survey. I mean, I know how this stuff works, but still changed pre or post pandemic. So my, my question was, I mean, as much as I know you're not an expert, maybe on this exact metric that they used for this particular survey, so it's hard to define exactly what they mean by cognitive reappraisal. But, but um, that being said, intuitively, do you think that the difference was more that, hey, okay, maybe a pandemic and this world craziness maybe washes out some of the positive tools that we have to deal with skin picking or is it that maybe this crazy situation where they didn't actually see the loneliness they thought they'd see, but it's a crazy situation might actually cause a difference in cognitive reappraisal such that maybe you're not even reappraising anymore because they didn't tell us. That's um, and actually that's a good, like, that's exactly. a good point. Yeah. And, and, um, but that being said, like, so that's my I question. Think, one other comment I make is actually of the three articles, I kind of like this one the best because it, it was opportunistic. It, it took, a, a world event that you can't just reproduce and looked at people who might actually be sensitive to it and, and it cared. And there are so many, only so many times in life where you can do something like that. And I felt that was really valuable science. So, so that's my whole commentary right there. Yeah, and I, I, wish there, I wish there would be a way to like do further research on it, but there's, we can't just start a pandemic any day. I um, hope not. I, I, I mean that completely seriously. I'm not starting a pandemic. Um, yeah, I'm just checking because they, I know they. Yeah, I was going to comment yeah. with something along the lines of what Nicole has commented and the fact that this was just done in Poland, which obviously the yeah. COVID restrictions are different there than in other countries. And obviously, for example, the US didn't have nationwide lockdowns like Poland. That's did. true. Um, sorry, I'm just checking one thing on the cognitive reappraisal thing again. 
And then the other thing culturally is that if you were to do this study, say in the United States, you probably would have, I, I mean, not to be reductionistic, but I think because of the lockdowns, like the more strict lockdowns in other countries led to perhaps mitigation of stress and loneliness where like in the US we're stressed all the time because we didn't have lockdowns. So I think that the interaction effects would have maybe looked a little bit different depending on where the study would have been conducted. Yeah, I, I do agree with that and that they sort of got back to a semi-normal life at some point. Well, and then and just, said here in the chat that her family is from Poland and she can say subjectively that Polish people from Poland are not very emotional. They tend to hold their feelings and not talk about negative situations within the family unit. So yeah, I, I know some people from Poland and a Polish family and I would, they would agree with that statement. <laughs> and I, I do think that taking culture into account is really important in studies because everything's different and it would be interesting. I wonder if there's anyone with any sort of data similar to this that had started something pre-pandemic and maybe hasn't published yet because that would be really cool. Um, let me see. Are there any questions I missed? Did we answer the one? Did I answer the? I don't think I answered the one from Susan on the. But could cognitive reappraisal be considered similar or synonymous with cognitive reframing? I think those would be similar. I'm not going to say synonymous because I'm not positive but I would definitely say similar and they have similar sort of output effects on how you're viewing a situation. Can I maybe make a comment? Yes, you can. If you okay, so, Well, one, one thing to keep in mind about this stuff is that like, cause I, I sort of have studied this ad nauseum. When, when it comes to a lot of these personality metrics, they're important and they mean something, but when it's, it's not always, depending on the ones you're comparing, too super useful to see them as concrete, discrete things. Because the, the way that these things even happen in the first place is they basically think I'm like, hmm, I've got an idea, maybe like what it's like to reappraise something. And then they come up with a whole bunch of questions of what they think might that might be. And then they give it to people. And when people take it, then they do this really cute math trick, usually, which is called principal component analysis. And what they do is they say, oh, look, these questions, these particular questions seem to hang together with really strong reliability across people. And they all kind of seem to mean the same thing, even though we worded it different. Um, and that's not, that's not like BS, but it's essentially that, you know, they just kind of came up with something that they seemed sim felt was a certain way. And look, people are answering it all the same way. So it is sort of a thing. But that's as far as they can define it. Um, and so then they give, you know, that survey to everybody else. And so when you see all these papers, like the ones you read that say like Cronbox Alpha, that's literally what that is. It's how well those questions hung together. And so if you get like a Cronbox a Alpha of 0.8 or higher, that's actually pretty good. That means that there's really something there and that these things kind of mean the same thing. But as far as like when you're comparing like, okay, we took one survey and that's what that was. And then you have another survey that kind of asks the same thing, then it's hard to say that it was really that different unless you take all those questions and put them into one massive survey and do the exact same thing again. And nobody does that because they don't want to lose their jobs and they want to report things in scientific papers. Um, so you really just sort of have to think of these things very intellectually, like, does it help to reappraise things? Yes, it does. And then kind of, you know, not worry about too much the fine points of some of these, you know, other discrete things, survey to survey. Well, and then Amanda asked here, what, uh, what could lead to the absence of correlation between automatic picking and reappraisal during the pandemic? Um, more voluntary picking maybe during this time question? Um. Let me see. Oh, one other thing I want to say is a lot of people do have combined automatic and focus picking. Um, I know there was one study on hair pulling and didn't look at skin picking that showed that all automatic 
pullers did some focused pulling, but not all focused pullers did automatic pulling. I don't know if that applies to skin picking, but that's something to keep in mind that it's not usually one or the other, it's often a combination. And not um, only that, but the definitions of focused and automatic are also being redefined. Yeah. The, or, the original scales are, um, all of the factor analyses on those measures are being redone and tweaked and finessed. And um, the original measures, like I think they used the Midas in this study. Uh, um, I believe so. So that. those Chris Flessner's definitions of automatic and focused, which were the yep. um, default for a long time, are kind of not obsolete, but there's there's newer versions that are now being defaulted to in newer studies. So I don't know how they that these authors um, defined focused picking, but there's a difference uh -huh. between is it conscious or unconscious? Yeah, they or is it um, trance like versus emotion driven. And those are two they completely different. They use the things. conscious and unconscious. So oh. conscious for focused and unconscious for automatic. Um, what I was looking at something to answer a question. Was there a question you asked me, Kathleen, or was well, I answering was, a question? Uh, it goes back to Amanda's. She stopped, okay. She asked, could you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I remember. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's what I was checking. Um, so I think, I believe, I mean, I, it doesn't necessarily surprise me that there is less of a correlation for automatic, um, just based on the definition that they use being unconscious and that it may be harder to reappraise a situation that makes you want to pick if you don't know that you're picking. Um, I think obviously there are ways to, there are still things that can be triggers beforehand that then lead to it that could be reappraised, but I think hard, harder to do like in the moment sort of reappraisal when you know it's gonna be something that would uh, trigger you to pick. Um, and I would, I would, I, wouldn't be surprised if there was more focused or voluntary picking during the pandemic as well. Um, let's see. So many good questions and suggestions in the chat. Yes, more qualitative and quantitative methods would be very nice. I agree. And um, explain automatic versus focused. I think I sort of did that before, but, and the definitions are changing as Kimmy said, but for this study they used automatic picking was unconscious and focused was in your conscious awareness. Are there any more questions? Well, we're coming to a good ending point time-wise for yours too, so that's good. Yay. Yay. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we can just move on to the next paper, which I believe would be Hannah Doyle presenting that one. All right, um, the second paper is called Shared and Unique Neural Mechanisms Underlying Pediatric Trichotillomania and Obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and it was a pretty meaty one. So <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Um, so for a little bit of background, um, OCD and trichotillomania are considered two different disorders. But there are a couple cognitive functions implicated in OCD that might also be implicated in trichotillomania, or at least some researchers think that. Um, and those two cognitive functions that they focus on in this study are performance monitoring, meaning like literally you're monitoring how you're doing in a task, and inhibitory control, meaning like how good are you at inhibiting a response um, when the situation arises. So like if you have a task to click a button and you need to click it at a certain time, like how well are you, how good are you at inhibiting it, um, yourself clicking it at the wrong time, for example. Um, so performance monitoring can be measured um, by a brain, 
a brain event related potential, which essentially is just um, some sort of brain activity or a brain response um, that can be measured. Um, and they do this using EEG in the study. Um, and previous studies for a little more background have shown that enlarged um, event related potentials, which I'm gonna actually call ERNs for the rest of this. So if you're confused, we can go over that again because um, it's related to, okay, I'm just gonna say ERNs. <laughs> I'm trying to make this simplified. But studies have seen enlarged ERNs in OCD populations um, previous to this study and attenuated ERNs in a trichotillomania population. Um, and additionally, um, they wanted to use EEG because you can use it to measure inhibitory control as well. Um, and those are the two functions, as I mentioned, that they wanted to study in um, pediatric TTM or trichotillomania and OCD populations. Um, no one has had done an EEG study in um, kids with trichotillomania and OCD prior to the study. And so that's why they were interested in doing this. Um, also, they thought it might be a cool way to maybe find some electrophysiological markers of disease state to possibly inform um, some treatment, some form of treatment um, in trichotillomania as things like that have been done for OCD. So the methods for the studies, they had a sample of um, 22 children with trichotillomania, 22 with OCD, and they had 19 healthy controls. They all underwent um, diagnostic interviews to assess anxiety, trichotillomania, severity, OCD severity, um, and overall functioning. Um, then they recorded, or they did EEG recordings um, during an Erickson flanker behavioral task. So the participants were doing a behavioral task while they were recording um, EEG. And it, um, they defined the task in uh, the paper. I'll try to say it right now. I, it might be easier to like have a figure, but um, basically what participants had to do is they had to indicate the direction of um, a bunch of arrows and there was five arrows in a row. They had to indicate by clicking a mouse whether the arrows were pointing right or left. Um, and in between the trials where all arrows would point right or all arrows would point left, there would be trials where some of the arrows would point right, but the middle one would be pointing the opposite way. Um, and those were known as incong incongruent trials. Um, and so the participants had to choose, they had to click which way the middle arrow was facing um, on any of the trials. Um, and typically in this task, it's harder for people to accurately um, and quickly respond which way the middle arrow is facing um, when there's an incongruent trial. So when arrows are facing different ways, it's more confusing. Um, and so that's how the task is kind of designed to measure these two cognitive functions of performance monitoring and inhibitory control that they're interested in. Hopefully that was concise. Sorry, I, I have a hard time describing behavioral tasks, but that was essentially what they were doing. They were just clicking which way the arrows were, were um, pointing. So after that, um, they, <laughs> there were a lot of results in this paper and I'm not an expert at all in EEG. Um, so I'm just gonna list the three main results um, hopefully concisely for you guys. So the first one is that at one particular EEG location, the ERN, which remember is that brain response, was more significantly more negative for the OCD um, participants than for the controls, but it was not significantly different between the, TT, the trichotillomania and the control populations. Um, secondly, They basically, they found that um, trichotillomania was grouped closer to controls by some metrics in the inhibitory control component um, <laughs> and closer to OCD by other metrics that they were using. Um, I, I, I can go into detail with those if you want. I Essentially, they just found differences between the trichotillomania and the OCD groups um, for the inhibitory control component as well. And it had to do with different areas of the brain and different like brain waves that they were measuring from the EEG essentially. I'm trying to make this like really easy for everyone. And I hope it's not too confusing um, because honestly, I thought that this was kind of a piece of a paper. Okay. And then the last thing, 
I don't even know if I want to talk about this, if it's relevant enough for me. Um, I don't know if I want to tackle that one, actually. Okay, we'll just go with those results for now. Um, and then they had like a bunch of additional ones too, but um, I'm going to wrap it up and say that <laughs> they, from the results they found, they were essentially seeing different electrophysiological -physio properties um, and patterns in the trichotillomania population that resemble the control um, participants in terms of inhibitory control processing. And then they found patterns in the TTM patients that are more similar to the OCD patients in terms of global function and clinical impairment. Um, so they were seeing different patterns using EEG um, to differentiate between trichotillomania and OCD, looking at different parts of the brain and um, different basically electrophysiological properties. Um, so This implies that there are um, EEG differences that could reflect different phenotypic aspects of trichotillomania and potential neural me mechanisms underlying certain um, cortical regions that were implicated, especially the motor cortex, for example, um, that underlie compens compens um, compensatory activity and effort in um, people who have trichotillomania. Um, and in the future, they want to obviously replicate this study because I did mention that it was a somewhat of a small sample size um, and then hopefully explore relevant um, potential treat, uh, treatments for trichotillomania based off of um, the electrophysiological markers that they are beginning to find looking at this study. All right, so that was it in a really <laughs> small nutshell. Um, yeah. You did a fabulous job with all, all of that. It's, yeah, it's it, was a, <laughs> it was a doozy of a study. I don't claim to understand all the results because I definitely don't. Um, yeah. Does anyone have so any? would you say the key takeaway is that uh, kids with trick the electrophysiological signals that their brain emits are more similar to healthy controls than people with OCD overall? And the different, what, what, the way that people that kids with trick are similar to kids with OCD is more in the on the clinical side, and then the yeah, well, they mentioned, side is yeah, and they actually mentioned like um, in like parietal areas of the brain, like there were clinical impairment, like functioning type things that they saw were similar between um, trichotillomania and OCD, and then more like in frontal part parts, CGM was resembling more of the uh, controls. And in terms of inhibitory control processing, trichotillomania was looking like the controls more than like OCD. So like people, okay. like the kids with OCD were having trouble with inhibitory control and the kids with trick less so. Okay, that makes sense because of the motor involvement that, that mm -hmm. it, would, it would make sense that at, from a frontal lobe perspective, people with trick are more similar to just people without. It yeah. would have been interesting to look at an impulse control disorder to see, because the switch between the different categories, it would have been really interesting to see if sort of which one trick fits more into based on just these brain imaging studies. Yeah. Especially in kids when oftentimes kids are at, have maybe one diagnosis rather than when you get older and you may have comorbidities. So it's easier to sort of suss out maybe what is what. Yes, sorry, I was looking at the question. I think that would have been interesting for sure, Hannah. I was um, actually thinking a little bit about like motor components versus cognitive components and like how good the task is at differentiating those two things. Um, given the fact that like there needs to be a response, meaning there needs to be a motor response and like whether that conflicts with what's happening in the brain and like what they're seeing on the EEG. But and not uh, to mention they used DSM-4 criteria to evaluate the, um, the trick patients. And they, it was funny that they said, oh, the DSM-4 and 5 criteria aren't really all that different, which is a lie. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. 
We've got uh, people with TTM had OCD. Oh, there were two different groups, um, a TTM group, an OCD group, and a healthy control group. Um, two people have questions that they want to say out loud, apparently. What, yeah. they ha what do they have in common and what was different? Sorry, that was a little confusing for me. Um, essentially, from what I got from it was essentially the trick kids looked like the control, like the control. So they looked healthier in terms of inhibitory control processing, but they looked more like OCD in, um, in terms of like clinical impairment. Um, it sounds like kids with trick have some things in common with the control and kids with, yes, yes. That's what it sounded like to me too. <laughs> this also yeah, in my sense. opinion was not the most clearly written um, paper. Were fMRIs done? No, this was just an EEG study. No. Um, Imaging was done. Um, clinical, what is clinical impairment? I actually don't, I would have to look and see if they like measured that specifically. If one of you two know that off the top of your head. I'm assuming it's. It, okay. I was just gonna say, I'm, look, I'm looking it up also. I think it was a survey they gave them. Yeah. I think they just scored similarly on the um, clinical global, global impair, impairment survey that they gave them. Yeah, that tracks because they talk about global functioning. So th this was just a self-report survey. Um, I have a question. For Eric. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Sorry, I'm trying to digest everything. Go ahead, Eric. What is it? So, so survey, or excuse me, not survey, uh, experiments, because this is a proper experiment. Uh, um, EG experiments of this type um, and this design usually kind of have like two goals. They're, they're usually one, okay, let's give different classes of people um, something tricky to do and see what their brains do differently versus how they perform differently on that tricky thing. Um, the other is that, okay, let's kind of have everybody do something and then let's just straight up look at what's different about their brains depending on their class. And, and I think they kind of, by the design of it, intended to do the former, but ended up with the latter because what they ended up doing was they're like, okay, so we're going to give them this Erickson task, which, which is really just a task where you see how well you can inhibit yourself and perform okay. Um, it's like a Stroop task, but easier. Um, and, um, and what they did was they actually really just looked at the, que the, the performance when they did badly. So, so they're essentially saying, okay, so you had a, a miss, you didn't do a hit what's your brain doing? Um, so they weren't really assessing that first part. They were just saying, okay, you've got some sort of post miss problem. Now let's see what your brain does. Um, and then they assess that between the classes. So what you ended up with is this study that just says, okay, this thing has happened to the brains of either your healthy controls, whatever you want to call that, because who's ever completely healthy, um, your, um, Trichotilla mania people or your OCD people? And what are their brains doing differently after a miss and how they're handling it? Um, and over what time? They really looked at an early and a late time, right? And um, the, the things, so, so the idea there usually is to like look at like, okay, when your brain's doing something, and by the way, Big caveat, EEG is not your brain. EEG is your cortex at best. Um, and in fact, it's yeah. a giant chunk of your cortex at a time. And in fact, it's all these dendrites, a specific part of a cell, just all charged at the same time in a huge spot to see anything. So it's like, what massive thing is a part of your brain doing at any one time? Um, and, 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 you know, and, and how is that different between the groups? What they're essentially looking at is like, oh, maybe if we find that thing, 
then we can actually look at what's different about those cells and maybe genetically different about these people and how can we help them, which is great. Um, and the only thing that really jumped out at me that was different about um, the TTM group were two things. Um, one, that they seem to just have higher theta powder overall. So if you have an oscillation between four and seven hertz and whatever the hell's going on in their brain early, late, anywhere, it's a little higher. Does, so one question is, does that say something about like a trance-like state to you? Um, and two, they found, I mean, they found like beta attenuation for OCD patients everywhere and you just expect that. Um, but they found this weird thing where it was in right cortex, specifically motor cortex, where you also have beta attenuation for TTM patients or, or patients, whatever you want to say, participants. Um, and that kind of starts to ask questions about like inhibition, but maybe a very specific physiologically different inhibition. So, so do you have any thoughts on that? Whether you think maybe like trance-like brain states and or sp very specific motor inhibition might play a role in TTM? Um, read the theta way. Thank you for your insights, by the way. I figured you would have things to say about UG. Um, trance-like, yeah, I, I did read. I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do about this. Actions, update later. Thank you. Okay. Um, I did read about the, the overall uh, theta power that they found. Um, in terms of trance-like states, that's super interesting because probably at least a subset of people with trichotillomania experience that sort of um, that sort of functioning during the actually during the behavior. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's definitely something that could be um, specific to the TDM population. It's a missed opportunity then that they didn't um, that they didn't look at polling style in this. That's what I, I think was thinking. Is I think they should have subtyped them. I'm I'm a little surprised they didn't actually. Um, and then your second question was about right motor cortex inhibition possibilities. Is that was that what your second question was? Well, specifically that what they found was like beta attenuation. So, so whenever you're looking at beta rhythms almost anywhere, except for a few restricted places, it's, all, it's always a negative thing. It's always knocking <laughs> down whatever activity was there before. So, so the question is, do you think it has some sort of problem with disinhibition, I guess would be the um, question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone else have something to say about that? I mean, yeah, it's, no, I, I, I actually don't know what, like I haven't read anything about that specifically. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, like I, I, don't, from I don't have evidence to like have an opinion about this, so, <laughs> but. Um, I don't know about from the neuroscience side, but from the psychological side, um, there definitely have been people in the past who have made a case for cognitive disinhibition being um, an influential factor in BFRBs because of the, the trance-like state and because of things like sensory sensitivity, so sensory stimuli and perhaps other sorts of stimuli um, are more discernible to people with BFRBs than people without them. So that's definitely something that people have considered. Sorry, can I jump in with a question? Yes, yeah, of course, John. Um, I'm just wondering, did they ever justify why they used the flanker task specifically for this test? Like, have there been previous tests that have used they've, the flanker task? Yeah, they've used it before for um, inhibitory control type studies like this one. Okay. Um, and is that shown in the past to be successful in these type of they They scenarios? say that it's um, there's validity to it. Um, I don't know enough about the behavioral task to like be able to say that myself. I had a couple of questions about like whether you can determine what's happening in the brain like cognitively, like um, 
versus like inhibition of a motor response is sometimes like a little bit different. Like having like the, the fact that the task requires you to respond, um, you like using your hand or something is not necessarily measuring like just what's happening up here cognitively. Yeah, um, I guess I'm kind of finding it hard to see how it translates over to trick and OCD. Right. I, I mean, yeah. I haven't, I haven't read the paper properly in, <laughs> in yeah. fairness. Um, I probably could do it reading it through, but yeah, I just, I'm kind of confused as to how it translates over to trick and OCD. So as far as they def, they did an okay job t um, talking about performance monitoring and why they've used it for that in OCD in the past. And essentially what they said is that um, when you're doing the task and it, for example, an OCD patient gets it wrong, first of all, they have to be aware that they got it wrong. But if they're aware that they got it wrong, there's all of a sudden this like a supposed hyper consciousness that happens in the OCD patient where they're like super conscious that all of a sudden they got this wrong. And apparently that's like a, a, a characteristic of, of OCD in general. Um, and that causes this potential. So this like spike in brain activity that they see on the EEG. Um, and so that's how they relate it. I don't know how tenuous of a relationship that is, or if that's something that's really been, um, shown. They, they cited a couple of papers, but I didn't have a chance to read them before. Oh, okay. Um, Interesting. So it's been shown in OCD, but mm -hmm. then has it been shown in trick because it's be difficult to compare the two disorders if it's only been mm -hmm. shown in one and they're not the same disorder, albeit in DSM-4, they happen to be under the same bracket, yeah. but they're very different disorders, you know? Yeah, and actually that I don't think is typically characteristic of um, people with trichotillomania, that sort of like hyper responsibility type um, of response. Um, so that's a really great question. I don't, as far as I know, they didn't address it unless I missed that in the paper. I was wondering how you think, and this isn't a challenge, it's just an opinion, that the findings of this paper help out the TTM and or OCD communities most. I think it's a good start, especially for trichotillomania um, and BFRBs to just get an idea of like what is happening um, during the brain and like if they can find something relevant that's different um, electrophysiologically, there might be like some things they can do to help you with that, like non-invasive treatment wise. So for example, I think they mentioned biofeedback or like neurostimulation. They can maybe like correct some of the um, differences that they see between the trichotillomania patients and the control in terms of the brain waves. Um, um, yeah, so that's what I that's what I thought was kind of cool about the study. Like as kind of difficult to read as it was, um, it could, it's like the first in a direction of like, how could we treat these disorders with something that's not invasive? Susan, I see your hand's been raised for a minute. Do you have something you wanna add in there? Oh, oh, I think I she left. Did we lose her? Yeah, like in the moment she was gonna answer and I think she left <laughs> instead. <laughs> So I'll wait, I'll give her a second, see if she comes back into the waiting room. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? There are ones that I haven't addressed. I'm trying to look at them. Somebody said, what are some limitations? They mentioned small sample size. Um, they mentioned they didn't really screen for comorbidities other than like comorbidities of OCD and, and TTM in those patients. Um, oh yeah, and they didn't subtype them. Um, they didn't subtype the OCD patients or the trichotillomania patients, so that's something to consider as well. Um, future research suggestions, I kind of mentioned this already, but they talked a lot about um, potential non-invasive treatments that this could lead to like way down in the future. Um, but first they want to replicate this sort of study or like, yeah, um, they would Welcome want to replicate back. it. Huh? Susan is back. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, yes. Um, I thought this was kind of a tangent, but Hannah, you just brought it up. Um, so mm -hmm. um, was, I didn't read the study, was this like the traditional EEG with uh, scalp electrodes, which of course is not invasive, but then I, it's my understanding that they're also developing other options like helmets or whatnot, where you don't actually need electrodes to be placed on the scalp. What, what did they use in this? And I guess I'm just wondering, because uh, like the non electrode uh, types of EEG options for the future seem like a better 
route to take if neurofeedback in a clinical setting is the goal? Yeah, that's, yeah, I don't know if that's necessarily the goal. It's something that they mentioned, but um, that's a great point. And it, it's, it was traditional EEG from what I gathered. Um, so electrodes on the scalp, but that's a really great point. Um, I'm trying to make sure I like didn't leave anyone out. I think somebody was saying something about observing their behavior while they're doing the task. And I think having the EEG cap with hair pullers makes it a little bit difficult to see if they're pulling because they have a 16 electrode cap on their heads. <laughs> Just a thought. Yeah. Well, and that's going to change how you interact with everything anyway, right? So right. Yeah. All of a absolutely. Sudden, so if you measure them when they take the electrodes you. off and there's all that goo. Right. That's a really good point. I feel like people, somebody brings this up every time. They're like, why don't they just image them while they're doing it? And I'm like, I really wish that that's, um, that could be done, but there are a lot of confounding factors that occur um, when you just try to do that sort of thing. Kimmy, if you are not already, one day you will be a brilliant scientist. Thank you. <laughs> Eric is an advanced student in my program. So as you can tell, he has a lot of experience in a lot of- You, you know, sounded <laughs> like a neuroscience student. I had you pinned as one. Don't pigeonhole me. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if I missed anything from the chat. If anyone has questions, just say it out loud. <laughs> I try to cut out all the ones in the chat. We can also, what, how long is this? Does this go? Uh, Until 6.30. Oh, okay. So we've got some time. Right. Yeah. Um, and you can always feel free to email us after this. Okay. If you have additional questions, you can um, send us a message on social email. media or shoot us an email. Here, if anyone has additional questions for me specifically. Um, I know what my if, for being <laughs> <laughs> I rejected. <laughs> um, do you guys mind if I round it out with the last paper of the night? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> so this one we saved for last because it is an exciting milestone specifically for us and for those of us who have been paying attention to the BPM for the past however many years or donated to help fund the BPM. So this is the first publication, I'm sorry, my computer is shaking, out of the BPM. And um, the title of it is Identifying Subtypes of Trichotillomania and Excoriation Disorder Using Mixture Modeling in a Multicenter Sample. So the overall goal of this study was phenotyping. And another word for phenotyping is subtyping. So what they wanted to do was subtype hair pulling and skin picking using as large a sample as they could find of people who were diagnosed with the behaviors and use gold standard questionnaires and gold standard stats to try to come up with some meaningful categories for them. So they um, surveyed, they, they tested 279 adults, 100 with trick, 81 with skin picking, 40 with both, which is relatively new, I'd say, and 58 controls. Um, for the BFRB groups, the BFRB had to be the primary psychiatric problem, but other diagnoses and even medication use was allowed as long as the medication was stable for, as long as the dose was stable for at least three months. Um, so a lot of BFRB studies don't allow those things. So this was a big win for this particular study. Um, good night, Jude, <laughs> thank you for joining us. I just had to give Jude a shout out because she always supports us. But um, <laughs> um, as far as the control group, they were not allowed to have any other psychiatric history. So maybe they were not the most representative, but at least the BFRB groups were. Um, they were given a ton of questionnaires. Um, they had a diagnostic interview to confirm their BFRB diagnosis. They took a... Um, long computer test of cognitive tasks, similar to um, the task that Hannah described in her um, rundown. And they went over psychiatric history, family psychiatric history, um, picking and pulling style, emotion regulation, sensory sensitivity, disability, perfectionism, and impulsivity. I think that's all of them that they uh, were. So they did like four or five hours of surveys and tests basically. 
And the one thing that I wish they had in there that they, I don't think they did was trauma history, because that's another thing that people have used to um, try and subtype people with BFRBs, but I don't think that was mentioned. Otherwise, the majority of concepts that I personally would be interested in were there. And um, I mentioned this before. Um, oh, Amanda was a participant in the BPM. That's amazing. I missed my window. So I envy anybody who got to take surveys for four and a half hours, four to five hours. Um, but the other thing that I mentioned earlier that I thought was interesting here was they used the revised version of the polling styles questionnaire. So like we mentioned, the original definitions of focused and automatic polling, I think this was specifically for TRIC, um, have been adapted over the years. And in this particular study, they use the revised version of that questionnaire rather than the original, which I thought was a, another big win as far as the methods. Um, and the statistical method they used to analyze these um, data was called mixture modeling. So mixture modeling combines two techniques called latent profile analysis and latent class analysis. And I am no expert, but it seems to me that those two techniques do the same thing. They're just used for different types of variables. One of them is used for continuous variables along the spectrum. And then the other one is used for discrete variables that have like different buckets that are pre-selected. So the point of all of these types of statistical techniques is to derive categories you, you put in a huge amount of data and it derives categories based on a hidden variable. So it tries to figure out from all this data what the hidden variable is and categorize groups accordingly. So um, the analysis was done in two stages. First, they came up with the categories and in order to do this, they used specifically only the variables related to BFRB symptoms. So like severity, uh, pulling or picking style, urges, things like that. And then after they came up with the categories, they compared the different groups on a bunch of other variables. So the results, the subtypes they came up with, they found three subtypes for trick and two for skin picking. And these subtypes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read them out. And I have some issues with the way that these subtypes are, are listed. So the first hair pulling subtype was called sensory sensitive hair pulling. So this had the fewest number of people. Um, they say it's highly focused, low frequency or intensity of urges. So they don't really have urges and they don't really pull as much. They have really high sensory sensitivity and they have higher impairment and mood problems than controls. This is gonna end up being an issue because all three of the hair pulling groups have impairment and mood issues. <laughs> um, the second subtype was called low awareness pulling. And this was the largest group of the hair pullers. Um, they, had, they, they had more automatic pulling with low urges, um, but also pulling due to emotional triggers and they had some mood and impairment, but they also were high in ADHD and impulsivity. And the third category of hair pullers were called impulsive slash perfectionist pullers. And they were right in the middle as far as how many people fell into this category. They pulled to control unpleasant feelings. They couldn't really resist their urges and they had the highest mood and impairment problems. So don't get it twisted. Everybody had some, but these guys had the most. Um, as well as high perfectionism, high impulsivity, and low distress tolerance, which means the ability to cope with negative emotions. So if you're confused about which of these categories you would fall into, don't worry, so am I. Um, and as far as the skin as far as the skin pickers, the two categories, the first one they called emotional slash reward pickers. And these, this was the largest group of the skin pickers. And these guys had a really hard time. They had strong and frequent urges to pick. They had both focused and automatic picking, low control, high perfectionism, low distress tolerance, high impairment and mood issues, and more ADHD. So this, I mean, 
doesn't really tell us anything new if you ask me. But then the smaller group was called functional pickers. And these, these people were fascinating to me because they had low urges, um, low levels of mood or impairment issues, uh, more mild picking overall, um, low perfectionism, uh, less distress and impairment, but they did have some ADHD and some sensory sensitivity. So with skin picking particularly, it kind of begs the question of whether these two groups are really subtypes or if they're just a severity spectrum, if you're just describing mild skin picking or moderate severe skin picking. So that was something that the authors raised in the paper. So that one I think needs a little bit more evaluation, but I think the bigger question is how do you actually differentiate these subtypes in the real world? I think that the, the setup and the methodology of the study was really great, but how do you get it into the clinic? And how do you make it easy for people to understand what subtype they are and what implications that has for their treatment course? So um, if you couldn't tell, I have a complicated relationship with this paper. Um, as far as caveats go, um, the, the big one I already covered, but the other ones were that they didn't find any neurocognitive deficits, which is something that past research has found, like um, a hard time with impulse control in the cognitive tasks. And so they didn't, just because they didn't find this doesn't mean it, that it wasn't there. Um, there are a couple of reasons why this could be the case, but um, some of them, it might have to do with the statistics they use. It might have to do with the fact that the questionnaires were really fine tuned to being able to pick up differences, but this cognitive test battery, maybe not so much. Um, the identification of categories was conservative. So uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I will agree that it is a subjective process which depends a lot on the type of statistical method and also what variables are considered important. These guys did get scientific consensus or consensus from the SAB and other experts, but there might be others who think that there are different variables to consider. Um, so it's not a completely objective process. And they double dipped the subjects with both hair pulling and skin picking. So if somebody had hair pulling and skin picking, they were counted twice, once in both groups. So that might have skewed the results a little bit, but probably not a great deal. Um, and we already talked about not quite ready to bring into the clinic. This needs a little bit more work. So as far as implications, this is a really great milestone paper and it really sets the stage for people to build on it in the future. Um, first things first, the finding that hair pulling and skin picking have different sets of subtypes, different numbers of subtypes and different sets of subtypes, kind of suggesting that there's not just one umbrella BFRB disorder, but that hair pulling and skin picking are ostensibly different and should be treated differently. Um, and it also found, or it also suggests that some of the things that people have looked at in the past, like age of onset, aren't necessarily as important as people used to think. Um, and the big one obviously is that it sets the stage for precision medicine when it comes to treatment. So some of these things that were really high in certain categories are, um, excellent treatment targets and some of them are already being targeted in treatment. Um, so I would like to see this done, uh, using other statistical techniques, even if I may not understand them, <laughs> just for some variety. Um, I'd like to see it replica replicated in other BFRBs to see if this holds, because I think there's a big question about which behaviors are truly diagnostically BFRBs and which ones are just bad habits. Um, that has not been answered yet. And replicated in um, kids too, because I think um, this stuff is different across the course of the lifespan, like Hannah's um, summary. Uh, so I think that we should, uh, and they did, they did test a number of kids in the BPM. So I'd like to see them do this analysis in the kids too. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at the chat now. <sighs> okay. Amanda definitely had a question at one point. Okay. There might be more. Uh, da, da, da. Is there anywhere I can learn about the revised definitions of automatic versus focused? Um, I, I, the, the first revision of it was, had Nancy Cuthin as the first author, and I want to say that was 2015. And then I think the second one was, I want to say 2019 or 2018, and Christine Lochner was the first author on that one. So those are, those are the ones that have the more tailored or definitions of focused and automatic. Um, um, I'm just in order, Amanda and then Eric. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was very interested in this paper, especially because I was a participant. So I read it That's right away when it was published. And I'm also a researcher, so I, I like to read about this. Um, so the first thing I think it uh, came to my mind when I read it is who am I in this study? Am I the type one or type two? Because I think it's the, the obvious question that comes to us. So I'm a skin picker only. And uh, when I read this, I thought I fit more like type one. And then mm -hmm. I realized that there's some characteristics that never fit to me like ADHD. I, like I have no way I have some like level of it. And I, I was kind of asking to my mother when I read this, like, mom, do you remember something when I was younger? Because <laughs> I can't see this on my, my profile. So That's so interesting. Yeah. So I was thinking, uh, what's the problem? In my mind, um, it, this type of analysis is a kind of cluster analysis. So they should um, cluster the, the people regarding the they have similar characteristics, but they uh, they have some people who could be in the other group because they are talking about the majority of the people, not all of them. Mm -hmm. So so it could be a, a important bias because, like for me, I could identify my, myself on some of these features, but it could be I answer something that I don't remember now and I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. It could be. Um, just I have a low level of something because they didn't uh, turn it to a dichotomic uh, answer. So they have like all the range of answers. Yeah. There are too many um, confusing things that I don't know um, how to use it, as you said, how, how to use it for us, how to apply in our life. How, how could we know, um, at least if we can classify ourselves, like how can we, took some questionnaire and say, okay, I, I'm this one, what I do now? It seems impossible to apply to real life. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, well, probability wise, it seems like it's the most likely that you would fall into the first category. And it seems that if you don't think you would fall into the first category, that there's something wrong with the subtyping <laughs> system that they used. I would say, that you're right. I think the fact that they didn't start with one variable of interest and instead were like, let's aggregate everything and see if there's a hidden latent variable that we could classify people against, that makes it more difficult to generalize into the real world. And I would also say, if you're really interested, look back at the consent you signed and see what you consented to, because there are certain studies that where you can request your data. Yeah, I, I've, I've questioned them a few times, but they never answered me. Uh. <laughs> I think they were preparing the papers because it was really quickly. I think I was a volunteer 2018. Uh. So if I think about my research, the, the data I collected in 2018, I didn't publish yet, many of them. So, so I feel like I hope that my volunteers do not require their, their results to be <laughs> <laughs> but that's well, awesome that you participated. I understand then. So I, I think, I hope they will send it for me at some point. Mm -hmm. I hope so too. 
All right, Eric, you've been waiting for an awful long time. Kimmy, can I just say that it's it's like you were born to do this. Oh that interpretation was on point. And, and it actually takes off a lot of what Amanda was just talking about. And that in, in these studies, there's, there's kind of always like this danger of whether or not, you know, the subgroups that they're trying to find of people are in whatever class are so different that they truly are just completely discrete classes. Or to your point, um, people on a spectra um, or somewhere in between, right? And so like, for example, your point about skin picking, maybe what they really actually found was like an intensity spectra. Um, but it, it's also possible that what they found were subclasses, but that just have a ton of overlap when it comes to, you know, TTM. So, so what, well, in a lot of these studies, when they're showing you the data in a really good way, what they like to, what they do is what they showed you here are all these bars and it's like the mean of each group for all these different like scales that they've got them on. And the bar, it, the, those figures were completely impossible. To right. Well, it looks, it looks real different, right? Cause what they're showing you is the mean for the whole group. And you see like one bar way up here and one bar way down there. And you're like, oh, that's way different. And yeah, statistically it is, it's significant, but what, really good studies will do is they'll show you each individual's answers and they'll plot it such that it's on a range for all the scales. And sometimes when you've got like four or five scales, like five dimensional plots are pretty tough, but you can still mm -hmm. do it. And what you'll see is every individual for their answers will end up somewhere in this space, right? And if they're truly different classes, you'll see a whole bunch of people here and a whole bunch of people there and a whole bunch of people there and they're pretty tightly close together. It's like, that's a realistic different class. And, and you can start to interpret it that way. Like Amanda was like, who am I on this? What, you know, should I feel this way on these different skills? But if they're not, and it's really just kind of like, there's, you know, sort of a general direction, then you'll see people all over the place. Like one group will be like here and the other group will be like here and it'll be like this massive Venn diagram, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important to like try to miss the out or get rid of or mitigate the danger of over-interpreting. Oh my gosh, you know, just because you might be whatever category three, that means you have to have all these other, you know, traits. And so my two questions, and I know that's a lot of preference, but I'm just responding to the conversation so far. Um, uh, my two questions are, one, do you think there was enough benefit in the classes that they found to kind of like outweigh those dangers we were just talking about? Um, and two, did you happen to notice? So the other thing is they used a bunch of statistics to find this, right? Yeah. Every, and by the way, with your modesty, you understood them perfectly. Oh, thank you. Um, but all those statistics have theoretical caveats and one of them for absolutely every one of them is a non-biased random sample. And did you mm -hmm. happen to notice that there was roughly 20% males in all their samples for every category and there was mostly females for all of them? 20% is generous. Yeah. So, it so wasn't question, even that much in many of the groups. Right, so, so the question is, do you, do you think that that holds up even if they have like a real sample and they're not mostly just looking at women? So those are my two questions. So with respect to your first question, I would say that you can still sort of parse out some signatures that are valuable from these subtypes. So if you were to ask me, I would say the notable thing about the first trick subtype is the high sensory sensitivity. And for the second one, I would say that it's the impulsive quality to it. And then the third one, I'd say, totally emotion driven. So you can begin to set the goalposts a little bit further apart for further study. And so I don't think it's all bad. I think they should have focused in on those notable clinically relevant um, features. And as far as the second one, I would caution you to against thinking that the sample that they used is not a representative sample because I would say, based on what we already know, there is a female preponderance. So that 80 to 90 percent female gender breakdown of the samples, it may not be representative as what we think like, yeah, they should sample more men, but it's representative as far as we know of the population. 
Okay, Christy's also, been the, waiting for an awful long time. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Nana. Of the, of the clinical population that seeks help, which is also mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Okay, Christy, thank you for your patience. Yeah, no, of course. Um, I was wondering, okay, I didn't properly read the paper, but um, whether they uh, found like statistically significant differences in either number, like number of comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidities, or whether there were clusterings of comorbidities. So for example, like more mood disorders in one group, more anxiety disorders in another group. Um, and then the kind of follow up to that would be, for example, I think I saw actually saw the call for um, participants, but I wasn't eligible because my primary disorder is not trichotillomania. Uh, and so wondering whether you think that this um, breakdown of subtypes would be useful in looking at those for whom it is a secondary disorder or whether you think that it may be less um, useful or um, true to uh, type for those who and whom it is secondary. Oh, these are both excellent questions. So first, I think when they, I think they specifically pulled out a history of ADHD, history of OCD, and a family history of both of those, and family history of substance abuse. I think those are the ones that they focused in on. Um, they didn't report anything with respect to any of those, except for maybe when they say high OC or high mood and high ADHD, maybe like higher uh, likelihood of having comorbid ADHD or mood disorder. I, I, it's really ambiguous to be honest with you. So I think that is a great uh, area for further follow-up. Yeah, I was and, really interested too, because they talk about emotional um, dysregulation as an aspect um, in certain subtypes, particularly one of my main disorders is um, borderline personality disorder, which is obviously largely an issue of emotion regulation. So yeah, and, and I would I would cons I would consider it maybe a missed opportunity that they made it so the BFRB had to be the primary psychiatric problem. I mean, as far as representativeness goes, like if you have BPD and trick, trick is never going to take <laughs> precedence over yeah. BPD. So yeah. I think I, I can understand why they did it because they want yeah. to have a, a baseline of mm -hmm. definitely people without too many more intense comorbidities. But I also think that it the the risk they ran was a less representative sample. And you're right. I don't know how valuable these subtypes would be for somebody who has their BFRB as a secondary or tertiary psychiatric problem. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Kathleen. Thank you. Not, not TLC Kathleen, Kathleen, <laughs> Kathleen. <laughs> You're on mute, I think. Yeah, there we go, I'm unmuted. Um, just going off of uh, Christie's uh, observations and questions about comorbidity, um, looking at the three subtypes there seems to, of TTM, there seems to be um, a a automatic or intense or focus pulling versus the emotional. I would kind of categorize those into two groups as far as effective um, treatment strategies. Um, Christy mentioned uh, BPD, borderline personality disorder, and I think the article actually mentioned the type three, uh, the type three classification would uh, be better suited to something like DBT, DBT, which is also a treatment for BBD. Um, so that was my observation. And as far as comorbidity, um, the author, yes, the author um, published another study about comorbidity and um, the prevalence. Uh, I think it was 500 participants. And there was, it did show, uh, significantly larger percentage of males than previously um, was identified. Uh, you know, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up because you're absolutely right. John Grant and his colleagues did publish another study earlier last year with the prevalence and um, yes, 
I think the finding about the 50-50 gender breakdown is being contested within the field, but I don't have any more information than that. I just know that it rubs some people the wrong way. So I don't know, it's neither here nor there um, how that is, but yeah, thank you for bringing up the comorbidity study. I actually had one thing back from a while ago um, on the ADHD thing. I'm interested in what ADHD definition they used because there's a lot of research going on in how women present with ADHD very differently from men and the majority of research and scales were built upon what how men present. And so I'd be interested in seeing what they used and if if they used all generally research based on male presenting ADHD, if that then would affect how women could feel like they could classify themselves, especially since the general knowledge on ADHD is still male focused. That's so interesting. Let me see what um, questionnaire they used. I was trying to look in the paper and I couldn't, like they didn't, they uh, used... I, didn't I just did a quick skim and they didn't seem to have a nice list. Um, they have supplementary material for this, I think. This is a perfect example of why having an unbiased sample is so important. Yeah. They use the adult ADHD self-report scale screener. I don't know if that means anything to you. <laughs> I'm going to Google it and see if I can okay. a copy. <laughs> yeah. I. That's the thing when you have disorders that are predominantly in women that the infrastructure of assessing them is often not what people seem to think it is. Um, but did we get to everybody's questions? Otherwise, does anybody have any final questions or final thoughts? Again, your interpretation of that paper was absolutely brilliant and I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so, I will just close it out by thanking you all for spending 90 minutes of your time hanging out with us. I really, really appreciate how engaged everybody was. Um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to Kathleen or any of us, and we look forward to talking more with you. Um, we will be having one more of these in April before the conference. So we would love it if you would join us for that one as well. We don't know yet what the papers will be, but. Um, we hope to see you all there. Um, and thanks again for tuning in. Have a great Thank night. You so much. Um, and again, this will be recorded. So if you missed anything or want to share it with anybody, it'll be up soon. Quick okay. question before you leave. Um, you've mentioned a couple times the conference. Has that been set up yet? Um, not officially. It, it, will, it will be happening um, in, in April and it's going to be virtual. Uh, the the um, official dates have not been decided yet, but we're working on it. We're getting close. Um, who would I submit um, presentation presenter? Uh, let me put her email address in the chat and you can shoot her an email. Her name's Leslie. She's great. There you go. All things conference related go to Leslie. All right. All right. Well, I think that's all we got. <laughs> oh, we have. It was so good to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thanks guys. Take care. Bye.